Perestroika Linguistics Series, and it's a great pleasure to have this as a guest lecture by Dr. Geraldine Horan from UCL, uh, who already helped me out with another topic for the Paper 4 series. You might have seen online her brilliant uh, explanation of language of totalitarianism and the um, LTI uh, publication by Victor Klemperer. And when she had given that lecture, she said, oh, I could also do something on swearing. And I, I thought this is actually something we need uh, definitely as one of the extreme ends of the topic's form of address uh, that is coming in at the later part of paper four. And to show the historic continuation of the close link between how you address somebody and uh, swearing, I've uh, brought one slide from one of the earliest documents of oral uh, German, namely the Pariser Gespräche from the 9th or 10th century, which uh, are put together f uh, by a Frenchman on how to uh, f uh, lead a conversation in um, German. And you have early forms of the polite way of addressing by the second uh, person plural, so the uh, ihr uh, in the um, line 41, was quäten ye herra? Uh, and then explained in Latin as quid dicitis vos? So what do you say, uh, sir, using the gear is like ye, ye, um, the you uh, form plural, and directly followed by a curse. Hundes ars in tine naso. It est canis culum in tuo naso. So uh, somebody who's wished uh, dogs ass uh, up uh, their nose. Um, and this person is addressed not with a formal second person plural, but rather with the informal second person singular. And similarly, uh, uh, on the next page, Gehorest du Narra? So, uh, listen, uh, you fool. So, the null is addressed in the uh, singular. That's uh, genug der Vorsprache von mir. <laughs> so, over to you, Geraldine. Thank you. So, hello. Uh, to those of you who have joined us from the previous class, and thank you to Henrike for uh, allowing me to come <coughs> talk to you about this topic. Um, as the title suggests, uh, we'll be talking about swearing in German, um, so I will be referring to swear words, and particularly in modern German, German borrows from English, so there will be some English swear words. So I hope not to cause offence, but that would be a shame, really, if I didn't mention them. Just a little bit about the um, picture on the left. Uh, I was in Cologne. I am in Cologne fairly regularly, and I was walking through an underpass, and I saw that um, and decided to photograph it. Actually, at the time, I wasn't really interested in the German swear word. I was interested in um, this uh, anglicism, ACAB, which you often see in uh, graffiti, uh, it stands for all cops are bastards. Um, but today I'm more interested in the German F word, uh, which for various reasons you don't actually see very much or used very much in German. It's certainly not used as widely as the English F word. And I'll talk about that a bit later. Um, so just I wanted to start off with some examples of what comes under swearing, and uh, I think, think it links in quite nicely with forms of address, because swearing, and we'll look at definitions in a minute, it can be directed at a person. So it does involve you addressing them, perhaps, and labelling them, because often insults, which count as swear words, can be nouns. So um, you are uh, choosing to label them in a particularly offensive way. So some from politics, some from literature. So the first one is from um, a member of the Green Party. 
Joschka Fischer. This is in 1984 in Parliament. He said to the Bundestagspräsident uh, Richard Stücklin, mit Verlaub, Herr Präsident, Sie sind ein Arschloch. <laughs> he, is, he was excluded from the chamber for saying that. It's unparliamentary language. What is interesting, of course, is the vulgarism, the insult, but it is combined with a very polite form of address. So popularly, we tend to say that you can only swear at someone if you are familiar or if you wish to address them with the informal pronoun, you, because swearing at someone is about um, threatening someone's face, to use the term from pragmatics. It is about sort of getting rid of the distance between you. Um, so if you retain the formal uh, form of address, then that, that actually strengthens, in many ways, strengthens the insult because you're combining it. It's actually incongruous. Um, so that is quite an interesting and very well-known example and quite unusual to call somebody Sie sind ein Arschloch rather than du bist ein Arschloch. Um, and then two um, examples from Goethe because, you know, we've got to mention Goethe. <laughs> it's good to mention literary examples. Um, and there, is, there are plenty of examples of swearing in literature. So the first one is from a poem by Goethe um, uh, which he was particularly angry at a, a reviewer critic who criticised his poetry. So he wrote a poem about it, because that's what poets do. Um, Schlag in Tod den Hund. So he's a dog. And again, we'll come to the sort of typology of swear words um, in a little while. Um, and then the very famous, it's known as the Goetz Zitat, from um, something being stolen out there, from Goetz von Berlichen. Um, where he says, um, er aber sag's ihm, er kann mich im Arsche lecken. Uh, and this is quite a, a, a long lasting insult because you can still say something similar today. Uh, and again, we'll talk about what about that particular insult um, uh, is relevant. Um, and what's interesting is that some editions, I think actually some of the reclam editions of that play actually miss out the Arsha. Um, uh, they actually censor it. Um, so for some, this was regarded as a wonderful, authentic example of genie sprache, you know, this sort of Sturm und Drang um, desire to be authentic and real and to speak like, like real people spoke. And of course, others were appalled by the, the vulgarity of it. So often swearing elicits very different responses. Um, then back to politics again more recently. Um, and uh, I have to say thank you for, to Henrik for reminding me about this. <laughs> um, the one very successful Anglicism is, uh, that's been uh, used wisely in German is shitstorm. Um, even though arguably, it, I, I don't know to say for certain whether it is actually an, an English word because it's not used in the same one. Hi. <laughs> it's not quite used in the same way in English, but it means a sort of media furore, a media sensation, a media scandal. Um, and it's used uh, in the media, it's used by politicians quite regularly without a sense of it being uh, a swear word or it being uh, problematic. So Angela Merkel appeared at this conference um, and she's talking about artificial intelligence and the challenges it, um, it uh, presents and she talks about it, sort of labelling it Neuland and commented on her words saying, when I said that before, das brachte mir einen großen Shitstorm ein. Uh, I'll come back to Shitstorm because it is quite an interesting example of um, swear words that are borrowed from English into German. So these are, are the aspects I'm going to look at. Um, terminology, communicative functions of swearing, uh, linguistic features, uh, types of swearing, codification, the importance of swearing, dictionaries, um, sociolinguistic factors and how they tie in very closely with um, questions of power, authority and censorship before coming to an end. So let's get going on that. So often we, we talk about cursing and swearing and it can get a little bit muddled. Um, starting first with English, um, 
if we look at the quotation on the right, cursing was very much tied up with religious belief. Um, and as it says there, cursing represents the invocation of a divinity, such as may God strike me dead. So you were calling on a higher supernatural authority to enact something. Or conversely and blasphemously, you can, uh, you can uh, call out to the devil. Um, in both cases, such utterances were seen as blasphemous because you were transgressing uh, your relationship with divinity. Um, that, that's why references to God and to the devil were seen as, as very taboo and very shocking um, in, uh, in earlier Christian societies. Um, and that's quite separate now from modern terms in which we tend to, to go to the sexual and the scatological and other, uh, other um, secular forms of insults. So cursing, for the most part, has lost this divine supernatural associations, but some still remain. Um, so in American English, for example, um, you can actually combine religious and, and uh, sexual vocabulary. There's an example there, goddamn motherfucker, for example. <laughs> um, or trying to find a British English example to call somebody a bloody shithead. <laughs> Just I was trying to think up some, some reasonable examples of where there are still remnants of the old religious aspect of cursing. Um, and over here is a sort of more a more general definition of swearing. It refers, this is taken from Anderson, Anderson and Trudgill's uh, book, it refers to something that is taboo or stigmatised. That is, has always been the case. So in previous centuries, it would have been religion. Um, and now, well, there are a range of taboos, and we'll look at what they are, but they often involve body parts, anatomy, uh, sex, but they can also um, be animals or other, other uh, areas that are considered either stigmatised or taboo, uh, should not be interpreted literally. Um, so if you tell someone to F off, you're not using the F word in its literal sexual sense, you're using it more in a metaphorical sense. And as we all know, uh, it can be used to express strong emotions and attitudes. So swearing is at the centre of, of our experiences in many respects as human beings, um, and it has a lot of important psychological and social functions. Yes. Um, I have a question. <laughs> yes. So if the F word is used in its sexual sense, yes. is it then no longer a swear word? That is the question. <laughs> I would say then it's, it's more of... It's more in the direction of obscenity than a swear word. But it, it, it is open to interpretation, and there is no wonder. For me, swearing involves swearing at something or someone, whether or describing frustration at a situation. So for me, that sort of metaphorical aspect is, is more about swearing. Um, but I think it's not that straightforward. So I would sort of say, um, to say, tell someone to F off would be swearing, but to describe a sexual encounter using the F word would me to be, be an obscenity. But that's just my view. <laughs> so I welcome some thoughts on that. One further complication is that in American English, um, often speakers will refer to cursing um, to mean secular and religious. So they talk about curse words. Don't curse in front of your mother, for example. Um, whereas in British English, we tend to talk more about swearing. So these are just some of the terminological considerations. Um, and then in German, <laughs> we've got fluchen und schimpfen. These are sort of two, two relevant words. Um, so if we're talking about swearing, we've also got to bear in mind... Um, that this maps onto the German schwören und schimpfen, because swearing, as in how we understand now, swearing now to, to say something rude or obscene, um, was linked to swearing an oath. So it comes back to the religious idea that when you cursed, you were actually swearing an oath. So may God strike me dead, uh, or may God strike you dead, more of a, um, you were actually swearing an oath to God 
um, if this doesn't happen, then may God strike me dead. Or if something happens, may God strike you dead. Um, so swearing uh, as the oath we swear, as I did this morning in the library, um, is actually linked to swearing uh, in modern terms. But of course, its meaning has shifted. Similarly, schwören, you don't tend to use schwören in German anymore to talk about uh, insulting someone or saying something taboo. So that meaning has been lost in that respect. So instead, you tend to say schimpfen. Um, and as it says there, swearing an oath um, is about invoking the divine, um, and its opposite number was fluchen, where you would also invoke the divine, um, but this was actually an illegitimate act. You were not permitted to do this. Um, so when we talk about swearing in English, in this context, talking about taboo language, it really refers closely to the German fluchen, schimpfen, jemand beschimpfen, ausschimpfen, and so on. So it's actually quite complicated. Um, but when we're looking at it from a German perspective, we need to bear in mind we're talking about fluchen and schimpfen in its various permutations. Um, so just to step back a bit before we look at German again, why do we swear? Um, as we've mentioned before, it's about emotions, as it says here, cursing. So Timothy Jay is uh, an American academic, so he uses the word cursing. Cursing permits humans to express strong emotions verbally in a manner that non-curse words cannot achieve. So because we are emotional, sexual, aggressive animals, well, I don't know, I guess we are, uh, because we have emotions and speech, we bring these together and we use cursing or swearing, as we'd say in British English, to express our emotions. So we express anger, frust frustration, fear, and surprise. So swearing can be spontaneous. What happens if you hit your thumb with a hammer? What comes out of your mouth? That's spontaneous. Or it can be intentional. Um, both come under the umbrella of swearing. Um, swearing at various... Uh, Studies seem to show that swearing functions as an analgesic, so it relieves pain. Um, so it has a very important physiological uh, function. Um, and uh, colleagues of mine at Keele University um, here in the UK have done quite a bit of research on this. You might have seen it or heard about it where uh, people put their hands in a container full of ice We've ever heard about the, this research. And if they utter a swear word uh, loudly, uh, they generally find that they can keep their hands in longer. They can tolerate the pain more. Um, this only works, A, if you're not a prolific swearer. Um, so if you are a prolific swearer and you don't hold any taboo words in, res in reserve, like the really strong ones, then it won't work. Uh, so you have to have that you have to have that arsenal of uh, taboo swear words, and it only works if you use actual swear words because they did a follow up study in which they made up swear words, um, and that did not have the same effect. So it's really tied into a lot of our physiological reactions. We swear to create social bonds, so particularly amongst uh, young people, for example, um, studies have been done on sort of constructions of, of uh, masculinity as well, heteronormative masculinity. Their swearing also seems to have um, a bonding function. We swear to challenge authority, to break the rules, and we swear to be creative and amusing. So it has a very, very rich range of functions. Um, as I mentioned before, for me, swearing, I look at swearing in terms of it being directed at something or someone. So it's directed at another person. And here we come into the realm of um, linguistic violence, really. So directing uh, a bad language, insulting language at another person in order to insult them uh, or diminish them in some way, or to provoke a reaction. Um, this is Gabriele Scheffler's uh, categories, which I find quite interesting. You can swear about yourself, you fucking idiot, for example. You can say about yourself, so uh, it doesn't have to always be 
uh, about someone else uh, for a variety of reasons, or you can swear about a, a, a third person. Um, and I think, again, this is where forms of address comes in. <laughs> what happens when you address swearing at someone? Um, how does that affect them? Um, and how does it affect the, the sort of social situation and the appropriateness of uh, the way in which you swear at them? Then we look at particular sort of linguistic features of swearing. Um, and uh, a colleague in Germany, Hans Martin Gauger, has produced this uh, really interesting book um, titled Das Feuchte und das Schmutzige. So that already gives you an idea of where German, <laughs> what sorts of um, themes and lexical fields German swear words are drawn from. Um, but as I mentioned just now, they tend to come from anything which is considered taboo or stigmatized or has some sort of very low, um, low status so, or high status. So that's quite interesting. But anything which, which is seen as uh, potentially problematic. So religion, family relations, so incest, for example, aspects of the anatomy, body, body parts, but also... Um, if you think of the uh, of swear words that are directed at people who are not able-bodied, for example, so all aspects of the body as well as body parts, genitalia, sex and sexuality, ethnicity and animals. And th this taboo stigmatization aspect always remains at the core, but which of these taboos are brought to the forefront shifts over time. So as we said before, religious swearing was considered extremely taboo in the past. Um, then it moved more towards uh, bodily functions, for example, uh, sex, animals. But now we could say, for example, uh, sex, gender and ethnicity are becoming uh, the new taboos in terms of racist swear words, ableist swear words, sexist swear words. Um, so taboos can shift um, through, uh, through time according to, to uh, social patterns and mores. Um, and if we look at it comparatively, we can say that in, in, gen in general... Um, there tends to be a focus on excrement. <laughs> I think that's probably safe to say. Um, Galga says that uh, in comparison, um, other Nachbarsprachen tend to use sexual swear words. So English is an example of that. Um, and uh, other research has shown by Nübling and <coughs> Vogel that... Um, Dutch draws on sexual vocabulary, and of course, I can I can um, ask. <laughs> I thought it was more Ill, uh, illness, sickness. Uh, you like to swear about cancer? Yes, exactly. That's what I thought. I thought that was interesting. Um, German scatological and Swedish on religious terminology. How is it in Frisian? You don't swear. That's very laudable. <laughs> um, but there, there are significant differences, which makes it fun to translate. Um, Jugendsprache is a very rich source of innovative and creative, um, creative swearing. So if you want to see in which direction swearing vocabulary is going then a good place to start is Jugendsprache. Um, the one thing about Jugendsprache is it changed very, changes very rapidly. It can really only be used and understood if you are in that age group. Um, and uh, it may not remain very long in the language, so it may be quite transitory. Um, so I had a go, this wonderful um, <laughs> website uh, that our colleagues at the, the uh, University of Halle-Wittenberg have put together um, includes a section on Jugendsprache and swearing. So Jugendsprache and Kiezdeutsch, 
so uh, urban variety now often referred to as Kurzdeutsch. Um, uh, these these um, groups have yielded some interesting uh, new swear words. So here, generally, we are talking about nouns. So we're we're labelling people. So lauch. Uh, Warm Dusche, for example. We've got some influences uh, from Turkish, for example. Some have come uh, through gaming. I'm, I'm at the very edge of my, of my knowledge here now. <laughs> um, so I'd better, be, I'd better be careful here. Um, so, and we have some, um, some uh, clippings here. We have some, uh, same here, um, and some abbreviations um, there, over there, you can't see it very uh, clearly, but I had a go at, and I only got eight out of fifteen, so my score was befriedigend, uh, which is fine because I am too old to know about Jugendsprache. Um, <laughs> but it is interesting to see the kinds of of uh, innovations that uh, are happening in uh, swear words. Now, another interesting aspect of swearing in modern German um, is that it borrows from English. Um, and there's a very interesting article I came across uh, on the web uh, which talks about this from an, an English speaker's perspective about how often in, uh, among German speakers you might hear the English F word and why that might be. Um, and it says there when it comes to swearing in their own language, Germans seem much more reluctant than us foul-mouthed Anglophones, but if they start cursing in English, it's a whole different matter. And I think this touches on something really, really interesting um, that I've also said, and this comes into translation, that if you translate the F word in English into German, if you use the German F word... So they give you an example there. If Germans were to say fick dich, that is incredibly rude. Mm. <laughs> it is, uh, even, I mean, I'm not a native speaker, but it, it does make me wince quite a lot. Um, whereas, arguably, saying the equivalent, saying, oh, fuck you, or fuck off. To, uh, to someone in English, perhaps in a friendly environment, um, would not actually have carry the same weight. Um, and then, of course, we've got the other factor to bear in mind, which is um, it's, in some respects, a lot easier to use a swear word from a language that's not your first language because it doesn't have that taboo. It doesn't have that emotional link. Um, so the F word is arguably the most successful anglicism <laughs> that has come into German. Um, uh, and I'll, I'll say a bit more about that in a minute, but what's interesting is that in the English-speaking world, there is, it becomes quite cyclical. There's quite a lot of interest in how the Germans use English swearing. Um, now, on this, I don't know if I can play that clip or not. Um, is it possible to play it on? Uh, I don't have hi, to. Um, <laughs> it told me that it had some difficulty uh, integrating. Oh, the, the external. Yeah. But uh, just click on it and see whether it does anything. I don't uh, think it does. Otherwise, wants. you can go to the YouTube. Um, or I. Uh, no, don't worry, don't worry. <laughs> it's. Um, it is quite interesting. This is the the um, ARD correspondentin, so from the German um, channel, the uh, ARD. She's the the English correspondent. Um, I thought I'd embedded it cleverly, but I never yeah, I think it uh, it just <laughs> didn't uh, like just, to embed. So I'll just briefly. It's uh, actually not that exciting. I feel I'm building it up a bit too much now. Um... Ja, das kann man wirklich nicht mehr anders nennen. Das ist eine Regierung, die ganz klar nicht mehr handlungsfähig ist. Und to get back to where I was. Um, anyway, she, uh, Annette Dittert is the, the uh, RID correspondentin for the UK and she was reporting on the, the Liz Trust Premier 
ship crisis back in September. And, Do you know which minute? Yes, it's from 26 onwards. Um, and she's quoting uh, a Conservative MP's a reaction to the chaos that's going haben. on. Then he says, plötzlich, es gebe doch keinen Fraktionszwang, obwohl das vorher angekündigt worden war, woraufhin dann der stellvertretende Fraktionschef das Parlament mit den Worten verließ, I'm fucking furious and I don't fucking care anymore. Ich übersetze das jetzt mal nicht, aber das ist eine Partei, wo wirklich jede... <lacht> So it's it's quite interesting that it was labelled. This is on the, the Euronews um, German channel where they were reporting on how she was reporting it. They they call it the f bomb, the f bomber, and that also tells us that swearing is powerful. So we talk about dropping the f bomb uh, in German. You talk about Kraft als Druck. So there is an acknowledgement that these sorts of words are powerful. So what is interesting is that she has reported what this MP has said, word for word, on national TV at, when is it, that must be the Tagesschau, so maybe goes out at around 8 o'clock at night. In Germany, there is no watershed. So you might be aware of here in the UK that before, is it 9 o'clock? I think you're not supposed to to broadcast anything that's considered obscene or problematic or uh, a, too disturbing but there is no such thing i mean obviously programs in germany will have sort of nur für i don't know 16 years so over 16 or whatever but they don't have a watershed so there isn't this sort of slightly pearl clutching attitude to we can't we can only offend you after nine o'clock at night um so this was seen as quite shocking it was reported on in the british media as well um interestingly she says ich übersetze das mal nicht i'm not going to translate so perhaps there is a recognition that if she translated this into german it would actually be quite offensive but of course it's also relying on the fact gesundheit that um that the audience will understand what she's talking about and she doesn't need to to uh, translate it but as i said the british media were absolutely amazed by the fact that she would be able to use this live on tv with no apology and no uh, uh, no um, bleeping out of uh, of those offensive words which takes us then to um this idea of of using english swear words um or um, obscenities. So as I said, the F word is very popular in German, uh, especially among young speakers, and it can also be used, there are actually some uh, innovative examples, if you go onto Twitter, for example, don't type the F word into Twitter, um, or German Twitter, but there are examples where somebody will say, ah oh, man, so ein fuck, uh, which seems to me a sort of translation from so ein scheiß. Uh, so there is some, I don't, I haven't gone into this I can't say for certain, but just anecdotally, it seems to me that fuck is becoming a synonym for scheiß in German. Um, but that's just my hunch. I'd have to explore it. So we have the word shitstorm. Now, shitstorm, again, isn't strictly speaking a swear word, as in you can't direct it at someone. But it is, it sort of comes under swearing as in you're using uh, vulgar language. So if we then extend swearing in its broadest sense. Um, so it's used fairly regularly. It doesn't really have quite the same equivalent actually in English. Um, so you will see examples of this. I think when Toblerone changed its um, recipe or how its chocolate was going to be produced, uh, it was reported in German the German press as a shockle shitstorm. Um, and of course, we had the Angela Merkel example where she used the term shitstorm. Um, and this is a, re a report from the CNN website uh, in the US uh, explaining how uh, German speakers will often use these uh, this bad language, but it's not, they don't mean it in the same way. And here was quite a, an interesting example. Shitstorm was voted Anglicismus des Jahres in 2011, and it entered the Duden Dictionary. So, you know, it is now a, officially a real word. It entered the uh, Duden Dictionary in 2013. Because of that and other Anglicisms in the same year, 
the purist organization, the Verein Deutsche Sprache, nominated the Duden as uh, Sprachpanscher des Jahres, <laughs> language defiler of the year, because of using anglicisms such as shitstorm and I think stalker they didn't like either. And then the Spiegel magazine very cheekily ran a story called This is the Shitstorm Shitstorm. Um, so there we go. <laughs> um, so of course, because swearing in another language doesn't have that same emotive link or effect, um, it becomes a, a sort of popular way of, of expressing yourself without causing the same level of offence. Now, another uh, area, rich area of swearing is dialectisms. Um, and these are some examples. So, uh, south of Germany and Austria, uh, traditionally Catholic areas, still tend to swear using religious references. Herr Gott Kruzifix, and then you can put them all together. Um, Herr Gott Sakrament Kruzifix, um, which you know is really very strong. Those examples over there on. Your right-hand side are from Kirsch, so from the Cologne dialect. Upper foot means monkey's ass. Uh, and Driskel, Dris is a dialectal form of Scheiße. Uh, so it just means uh, Driskel, Kel, which I would translate as bastard or effing bastard. Um, so there is quite a lot of material and quite a lot of interest on swearing in dialect um, and this links to our concepts of standardization um, and the way in which we link standardization and standard forms of the language to social factors such as good manners, polite speech, good behavior and so on. Um, and the idea is that, that your dialect is not part of the standard, so therefore, in some respects, it's more authentic. Again, it comes back to this idea, um, what do you, when you hit your, your thumb with a hammer, what comes out of your mouth? Well, it might be um, one of these words. So your dialect is closer to your true, authentic self. It's not something, a language that you have acquired. Also, though, because dialects traditionally are excluded from um, formal situations, so you won't use them in education, you won't use them in government, for example, you won't use them in institutions, they have that very private, intimate feel. Um, and so you have a lot more freedom to say things in your dialect that you wouldn't say in standard German, um, because they're not part of this official formal use of language. So that's why it's quite popular. And for that reason, it's not seen as a threat if you swear uh, in dialect. Um, and it often seems quite funny and quite amusing. Um, so this, the dialect swear words remain a sort of very uh, active uh, form or an active source of vocabulary. And we have various or many different types uh, of um, Schimpfwörter Bücher, uh, so the codification of, of swear words, and we've got various types, swearing, general swearing dictionaries, um, dialect swearing dictionaries, there are well over 30 different publications which uh, itemise swearing in specific dialects, um, then there are comparative multilingual swearing dictionaries that you can uh, look at, and then specialised Swearing dictionary, so called Fachschimpfwörterbuch, <laughs> very important. So, parliamentary swearing, um, how to be, if you're you know, down with the kids, das Zene Schimpfwörterbuch, if you're sort of in very trendy um, circles, how you swear, how you swear at the office, how you swear to men or at men, um, and so on. And it has a long history. So, um, it is thought that uh, Georg Albrecht's Fluch ABC from uh, 1675 is the earliest swearing dictionary in German. And hopefully when, when uh, we have our conversation with Andrea, we can look at the sort of historical aspects of swearing um, and the popularity of 
compendiums of swearing, um, which were supposed to warn people not to swear, but actually became bestsellers precisely because people like reading about swear words. <laughs> so these are all, this is just a few examples of the dialect swearing dictionaries. As you can see, there are many of them. Um, uh, and this reflects a, sort, a, a, a nostalgia in some respects and renewed interest in dialects as a form of, as a, a means of marking your local identity. Uh, and within that, as I said, swearing is often seen as, as being a, a manifestation of your authentic, unpolished self. Uh, and people are interested in dialect swearing and they buy these dictionaries uh, because dialect swearing is seen as being very distinctive and very colourful, also quite amusing. Um, as it says here, gefühlsbetont and direct. These are valued uh, manifestations or valued forms of the language which are perhaps lost in standard varieties. Um, and it is a, 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 a manifestation of regional and dialect pride. So if you in Cologne call someone a Driskel, um, I wouldn't recommend it uh, necessarily just off the, off the top of your head, but Rather than saying uh, scheißkel, you are signalling, I'm part of this local group. I know the language. Um, so it has a lot of, a lot of functions to do with, with signalling identity. Attitudes to swearing. So swearing is considered bad language. It is not part of the standard, um, and that's where it gains its power from. So, so it relies, the important thing about bad language in general is it relies on these taboos, um, it relies on the fact that this sort of language is not tolerated in order to gain its power. So it is, a, it is a, a, an important relationship um, and it's linked to social attitudes. So swearing is linked to, to challenging authority, so it challenges concepts of, of societal order purity and civility. This, I, this notion that uh, comes from Mary Douglas's equation of social order with purity. So social order is good and pure. Disorder is contamination. Swearing is contamination or bad language is contamination. It's uncivil. So that's where I think a lot of our ideas that that's, that even uttering a swear word is somehow, it contaminates our mouths. Also links to this religious notion that speech is a gift from God. And if we use it to, to utter these taboo things, then we are, are, we are contaminating, we're desecrating the, the uh, sacredness of speech. Um, and then this is tied in with linguistic attitudes. So... Swearing is not part of the standard language. It's not part of formal, official use. Um, it is a sign of linguistic impoverishment. It is a sign of a poorly socialised speaker. And because language and social structures are so strongly intertwined, um, it means that, that bad language, swearing is associated with bad character, for example. And it's often linked to other... Um, activities that are frowned upon, such as drinking, gambling, smoking. So <laughs> they're all linked to each other. And as uh, Battistella says here, you, attitudes, uh, lang language purist attitudes apply to swearing as much as to, to other forms of language, such as so-called good grammar. And of course, we apply social importance to using language correctly and appropriately. Um, so avoiding coarse language signals that you understand uh, the boundaries, as it says here, between public and private discourse. So it's also linked to social power and authority, what uh, Tony McHenry calls the linguistic mandate of power. So the whole system of language is linked to uh, and reflects, communicates, as it says here, the values and conventions of the political and the social system. So language and social norms and behaviours are very, very uh, 
strongly or very tightly combined. Um, and it is through language that we communicate, as it says here, public rationality, morality, uh, that laws are enacted and enforced. Um, and this also ties into who understands these rules, who plays by these rules, and who has this linguistic mandate of power, who is able to use the standard language, the official language, correctly. Now, of course, the question then arises, is swearing a sign of, sign of powerful or powerless language? Because often swearing is seen as a loss of face, to use the pragmatic term, um, and it's also seen as a, a, almost a, a linguistic act of desperation. So you lose power by using swear, or by swearing or using taboo language. However, it's also powerful in that it challenges this social authority. So this means that powerful people can often take a risk and use swear words. So Joschka Fischer, for example, the Green MP saying, mit Verlaub, sie sind ein, Arsch, ein Arschloch. Um, he is in a position of power to do so because, yes, he will have been thrown out of the chamber, but he, he will not really lose anything. Um, so often privileged members of privileged groups in societies, for example, white men, will use swear words sort of as a manifestation of their masculinity, but also because they're in a position of power, which means they can gamble. They can, they can take risks with challenging this social order and this linguistic mandate of power. So it's always a risky enterprise to swear <laughs> uh, because it can, it can uh, lead to social exclusion, which brings me to the societal control of swearing. Uh, and in fact, I was talking to uh, Henrika earlier on. She was asking if I was going to talk about gestures, as in rude gestures. Uh, and interestingly, um, in German, in the public realm, um, you can be fined, you can be put in prison for up to two years if you say or behave in a way that is considered to be, um, to come under the Beleidigungsgesetz. There's also the Übler Nachrede and the Verleumdungsgesetze as well, but this is one of the main ones. So if you show someone the middle finger, you are actually doing the sort of a physical paralinguistic version of this of uttering something, they're, they're treated the same. So this is from the Busgeld catalogue, this year's uh, latest one, in which you can find out what happens if you say this either to a police officer or to another person on the street, another, another um, uh, driver or, or pedestrian or so on. Um, interestingly here, it's, it's uh, the sexist taunt, du Mädchen, and this is how much you will get fined uh, this is based on previous cases. Uh, Leck mich doch, so here we've got the Arsch thing again, Holzkopf. This is an interesting one because they're not actually swearing directly. Uh, they're trying to be quite smart. Whoever said this, am liebsten würde ich jetzt Arschloch zu dir sagen. So if, you know, if I could, I'd really like to call you an asshole. Um, but it didn't work really because they got fined quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> So we've got the animal reference here. So this is an example that, again, about what happens if you try to, to transgress the social order and civility that is uh, bound up in the way in which we communicate with each other politely. So again, uh, in a lot of cases, we're actually talking about addressing somebody by, by referring, by comparing them to uh, something which is uh, less appealing We're or also, taboo. Uh, coming back to our first point, uh, the fine is partly explained by using the informal do. Exactly, yes, yes. So you can be fined even if you don't actually swear at a police officer, but if you just use the do form. Exactly, if you look on the Busco catalogue, that's one of the things, saying duzen to a police officer uh, will, will get you a fine, yes. So it's, it's, the, it's the familiarity, again, the sort of transgression from, from formal to informal that, that also... But I wouldn't like to try and say, 
Ziholtzkopf. <laughs> sure. Maybe they might knock, I don't know, a couple of hundred euros off if you mm -hmm. use the, the formal, uh, but it's probably best not to find out. Um, so there are important limits to, uh, to, uh, to swearing. Uh, and again, it is a reciprocal relationship. Swear words, in order to maintain their taboo and powerful status, they, they need to rely on the fact that they are subject to censure. Um, and, but as I said, these shift uh, what is considered offensive uh, shifts. Um, and there's another important element just to finish off with, because I know we're coming up to the hour now, um, is that you know, we can laugh about calling someone an arschloch or a hund or uh, a lauch, to use the example from Jugendsprache. But of course, a lot of swear words um, are manifestations of linguistic violence. They are racist, they are sexless, they are ableist, they are hitting out at people who are perhaps not in a position of power. So we've got to, to bear that in mind, that these, these are sometimes used as manifestations of hate speech and have now become part of you know, the, the culture wars and, uh, and discussions of political correctness. Um, so this is, it is worth bearing in mind that the, these words, they're called Kraftausdrücke for a reason, they, they are powerful and they do have effects on the person that they're directed at. So, just to finish off, uh, some of the things that I've raced through in the last, uh, the last 50 minutes or so. Swearing has an important, a range of important social, uh, sorry, psychological, communicative and social functions. So it is very firmly embedded in our, um, our um, behaviour as linguistic and social beings. Swearing can be employed humorously, creatively. It has a range of these functions, but it's worth being in mind that swearing has consequences. So it does have an effect. It is a speech act. Um, linguistically, swear words rely on the taboos um, uh, in various forms. And as I've said, they can shift over time. Um, and we've got to bear in mind the strong regional and dialectal uh, dimension to swear words and bad language in general um, and, and there is an ongoing interest in codifying swear words um, and hopefully uh, next when we have our conversation with Andrea we can talk about some of these swearing guides and swearing dictionaries to see that it has the interest in it has been going on for many many centuries okay thank you very much <laughs> Many thanks. Really fascinating. Um, and uh, uh, Geraldine has provided a nice bibliography, which I'll upload uh, to Canvas. Just um, a preview of what's happening next. So um, we'll be sending this recording to Andrea Seidel in Halle, who curated this very interesting exhibition on historic swear words. And uh, she'll do a kind of response to the lecture, providing particularly examples from Reformation period insults. So uh, watch out that for that. We'll record that next Friday and upload it. Um, I'll be in, in London next Friday, and Johannike will uh, be at this uh, position talking about Old Frisian and its uh, place among the Germanic dialects, so continuing from our topic of uh, German dialects. And then in week eight, we'll have a double bill on etymology with somebody here from the Oxford English Dictionary and a visiting lecturer from Leipzig on um, uh, Old High German. Uh, I know several of you have to go. Uh, those who want to stay on and have a quick conversation with <laughs> Geraldine, welcome uh, to go with us for a cup of tea. Thank you.